And hello, everybody. It's Tuesday evening, 7 p.m., Elisha's Home and Ministries. I can see right before I came on, I noticed that there was, again, 35, 40 people that are my friends that happen to be on. I hope that you're going to go Facebook Live with us. If you do, please share it right away so that other people can see that we're on and they have a chance to listen to it. And don't forget, we are on YouTube. We have our YouTube channel. And if you put it on face, you can see it on Facebook and, and uh, share it with somebody. Or you can go to Elisha'sHome.com and there's a place there where people can go directly to our YouTube channel. And it automatically takes you to the most recent one and then you can go down. I think you, Sunday I counted, we had 84 or 85 uh, videos so far. And that's since COVID started its thing. So the Lord has been blessing us with using this uh, Facebook Live videos. And I praise the Lord for that. Don't forget, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. is Dr. Peg. Friday night is um, Pastor Tim at 7. And Sunday morning, we start around 10, oh, about 10.45 for Facebook Live. 10 o'clock at our church. We'd love to have you come out to our church and, and worship with us. Uh, please realize that we will be... Um, you know, requesting if you can wear your mask, but if you if you can't for some medical reason, that's fine. And during worship, there are times you just have to take your mask off. That's fine. We have everybody separated, and there's plenty of um, uh, what do they call that? Social distancing. So it's really up to you. But we love having Facebook Live that we can use that also. Let's see. On Sunday morning, I spoke on receiving the final harvest and I've been talking about seed time and harvest a lot um, I mentioned also that often I I will preach on things that I'm dealing with at the moment and I last just this last Saturday I was blessed to do a funeral uh, internment for somebody and it happened to be it just I believe it was just a great service um, just the family and everybody they were just so they were wonderful and the man really has set the example uh, for the community and I just I, I shared a lot how that you know how how important it is for us to leave uh, and plant seeds into people's lives so that one day uh, their children and their children's children will be blessed so tonight I'd like to hopefully I'll be able to finish part I'll be able to finish receiving the final harvest um, so let me let me get right to it uh, eternity is our final reward, our final harvest. I am a true believer in receiving a harvest here on earth for thousands and even millions of seeds that we've planted over a lifetime. But there is a final harvest. Peg would call it the final chapter or the end chapter of one's book. Have you ever looked at it that way? That is so good. You know, what was that person's final chapter? You know, um, recently we knew somebody who passed away and we both looked at that and said, Boy, that wasn't a very good um, final chapter. Usually, the final chapter is like the crescent, crescendo. Is that the right word? At the you know at the end, and you know there's victory, and the person is with the Lord, and so on, and you know up leading up to it, there's victory after victory, and but sometimes there's not, and so that final chapter isn't isn't what uh, I believe most people would want, and I, I really believe that we as Christians should say our final chapter should be just as good as the first one. It should be just, it should be great. It should be filled with victory. It should be filled with excitement. And that's something we really need to contemplate. And I also, I went to the Passion Bible in uh, Psalm 84, uh, verse 10, said, for just one day of intimacy with you. This is the, <clears throat> this should be our desire. This is the, uh, the psalmist who wrote this. Desire was to be with God, to be with the Lord. And it says, for just one day of intimacy with you, or one day in your courts, Lord, one day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand in the threshold in front of the gate beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God, than to live my life without you in the most beautiful palace of the wicked. For the Lord God is brighter than the brilliance of the sunrise, wrapping himself around me like a shield. He is so generous with his gifts of grace and glory, those who walk along his path with integrity will never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all. Verse 12, O Lord of heaven, ar heaven's armies, what euphoria fills those who, tr who forever trust in you. I mean, it's, it's that, in fact, there's a song we used to sing, um, One Day in Your Courts, like a thousand elsewhere. 
Um, it's, it's just beautiful. And so we should desire that final harvest, and we should desire to finally be with him. Uh, Dr. Wood, when he was here on earth, giving us, um, sorry about that, giving us some uh, information about what heaven was like, he talked about the mansion that the Lord was building for him, and that it wasn't finished. And I thought, hmm, well, I'm sure when he went home this last time, it was finished. And it's going to be beautiful. And so we should be looking forward to eternity, but not not just sitting back on our hunches, is that what they call it, and doing nothing. We should be living through something that I had shared earlier that Pastor Tim had talked about. Oh, I think about two years ago he preached on living um, living be living in the dash or living the dash and many of you heard me read the poem so I'm not going to read the whole poem tonight but I will read a little bit of what it what I'm trying to say you know when you go to a cemetery you'll see somebody was born on this date and then there's a dash and then they passed away on this date it's called living between the dash or between the dates is the dash or living the dash so the phrase live your dash comes from one of the most popular poems in the world by Linda Ellis it means to be mindful that we're only on this earth a little while. It means to spend each day with passion and purpose and to inspire others by living a life of joy, compassion, and kindness. So, what's the opposite of joy? Well, hate or sadness. Compassion would be hatred, I guess. Kindness, again, would be hatred. So you don't want to live the opposite of joy, compassion, and kindness. Live your dash. Be slow to anger. Anger can become like a cancer and eat away at your ability to be joyful and kind. Life is too short. Choose forgiveness and let it go. William Ward said, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the handcuffs of hate. So other things you can do to live, live the dash. Say thank you. Just try saying thank you. Those two little words have incredible power. Think about how you feel when someone thanks you. You feel validated and appreciated. When you do the same for other people, you pass along the positive emotion. It may be just what they needed at that moment. Have you ever just, has somebody come up to you and just say, you know what, I just want, want you to know I really appreciate you. I appreciate what you've done for me. Just And then they walk away. And that makes your day, that makes your week, that makes your month. Well, be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit because God might be asking you to do that more than you realize. Love people, and I mean that sincerely. Love the people. Something that bothers me so much, and I didn't notice this until, actually until I was a chaplain at the previous ministry, and there were, there must have been, I want to say 30, 40, 50 people that would come at times to our, to our chapel service. Sometimes it would only be a dozen. But most of them were retired missionaries or pastors. Uh, and I mean, these people had been missionaries all around the world. These people had been pastors all over the place. And they were filled with so much knowledge, but they didn't get much respect. And it, it's almost like people quit loving them when they got to a certain age. And I, that so bothers me. We can glean so much from the people that go before us. So anyway, our dash moves with lightning speed. It seems like only yesterday the kids were toddlers learning to walk, and now they've got children of their own. Boy, I can relate to that. As they say, the days are long, but the years are short. Never miss an opportunity to show love and say, I love you. I shared on Sunday how, how important that was because my I got to say I love you to my one brother when he passed. My other brother felt so bad because he never got to say he loved him. He passed before he had a chance to say that. And I always tell everybody, the last words you say to somebody you love should be, I love you. And mean it. Don't just say it to say, well, I said it. Because that means nothing. It has to come from the heart. Treat others with respect. You, and at times, it's hard to treat others with respect when they don't respect you. I know that. And I try so hard to do so. And God's still working on me. But we really need to respect each other. And we need to respect each other's feelings and the way that we the way we look at things. And I've said this over and over again for the last five or six months that we've had this COVID thing. 
we don't have to agree on all the different things that are going on. But we don't have to beat each other up and allow the church to be divided because of it. We need to say, okay, well, we just agree to disagree. And, but people will continually just browbeat you about it. I see it all over Facebook. And you know what? Maybe I'm as guilty as the, the rest because I'll sit there and I'll say, well, what do you guys think about this? What do you think about that? Because there's so many different thoughts and views about them. It's almost asking somebody like, what's your favorite color? And nobody can agree. But you don't hate people because, well, I like blue and I like orange. You don't do that. But we seem to be doing, the devil is using that to divide the church. And we need to stop that. So we need to respect each other. The other thing is to wear a smile. You know, sometimes, in a, again, I, I, deal, I deal with some older people sometimes and they're hard of hearing. And sometimes just a smile is louder than anything you can say with your voice. Our dash may be short, but it can be wide. Often a simple smile will break through tension and stress. A smile will not only affect those around you, but it will change your attitude and your outlook on life. So remember, life is short. Make every moment matter. It's been said that we don't remember the days, we remember the moments. We don't remember the days, but we do remember the moments. Being present and in the moment provides some of life's greatest joys. And I'm blessed to have a son. My youngest son, he remembers those moments. He can tell you things from when he was so small up until just yesterday. Well, Dad, you preached on this. Dad, you already talked about that. Don't you remember when you preached on that song? I'm saying, I have no clue. So sometimes I'll say, hey, did I preach on that? Yes, Dad, you did two years ago in three weeks. Oh, okay. So, but you know what? Those moments can be joyful or they can be very painful. So examine your heart and think about what is true and what is real. Now is the time to rearrange the things that need to be changed. Live your dash well. So if you see things in your life that need to change, change it now. Don't wait until something really bad happens or until somebody passes away and you never see him again. Live that dash while here on earth. And I love this. Live that dash while here on this earth can plant while you're here on this earth can plant those seeds in other people's lives that can lead them to eternity with Christ. So, you know, you people say, "Well, I don't know." In fact, I got this really cool phone call just two days ago, and uh, there's a person in the community that is just a really uh, rough around the edges person, and um, I got the opportunity, or one of my sons did. I think I'm not sure which one of us, but. But we had a chance to give our, our book called Reflections to this person. And it's it's a story about um, each one of the four members of this uh, team, our staff. And, you know, starting from when we got saved or when we were born, got saved. And, and we came all the way to the ministry. And, and, and the story in between, you can say the dash, for the four of us. And what was so cool, I think that was given it to him. The book was given to him about a year ago, maybe longer. And he calls me up on the phone and he said, Pastor Rob, I say, hey, you know, and I knew who it was. And he said, I just finished the book Reflections. I said, really? And all through that book, there's, there's times that you can get saved and get born again. So as he's talking to me, he said, yeah, my wife put it in with my recipes. And the next thing you know, I was bored and I was sick. So I looked up to look up some recipes and there the book was. So I read it and he said it was great. And then I started to talk to him about it. And of course, what happens? Customer comes in and he says, well, I got to hang up. I'll talk to you another time. But you know, the seed was planted a year ago, maybe longer. And I believe, if, it's just like when Paul the Apostle got saved, when he was Saul. He was working for the, for the opposite. He was working for the enemy. And when he got saved, he was one of the greatest for the Lord. And that's what I believe in. So it just shows you, you don't know how just being being there for that person, doing the right thing, even though that person and their, the way they act might repulse you. It didn't repulse Christ when, when he laid hands on the uh, people that had, you know, all the different diseases, you know, with leprosy and, and all. And, and honestly, a lot of those people didn't shower much, especially if they were poor. So that didn't, that didn't bother him one bit. So living that dash, 
just live that dash. A scripture that I, I just love is 1 John 5.13 in the Amplified. So these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which represents all that Jesus Christ is and does, so that you will know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have eternal life. And so once you're born again, you should it should be settled. You should be confident that you have eternal life. Verse 14 says, This is the remarkable degree of confidence which we as believers are entitled to and have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. And if we know for a, a fact, as indeed we do, that he hears and he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted to us the request which we have asked from him. That's powerful. So once you're born again, you, you get these benefits that are just, and they can't take your benefits away from you. I love that. Um, the scriptures say you don't know what tomorrow will bring. Proverbs 27, 1, never brag about the plans you have for tomorrow, for you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring to you. And a perfect example of this Oh, I want to say about two months ago, I started a project, and I, I'm a project-oriented person. Once I start it, I, I like to finish it right away. I mean, I'll work hours on something, building it, fixing it, and so on. But I, I had this project, and I wanted to do it right. And lo and behold, what happened? Every time I had a half an hour here, an hour there that I thought I could go work on it, something came up. And I started saying, Lord, you know, this, I'm not, it's going to take me a while. And it did. It took me two and a half months, I believe, to finally finish it. And I was able to bring it up to the house and it looks wonderful and everything. But my plans didn't connect with God's plans because those interruptions that I had, most of those interruptions were godly interruptions. And I, I cut years ago and I quit begging God all the time. I want some time off. I want some time to to do this or that. I, I just say, God, you know what my plans are. Do they line up with yours? And often they do, but not always. So in James 4.14, in the Amplified, it says, Yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen in your life tomorrow. This is the Amplified Bible. What is secure in your life? You're merely a vapor like a puff of smoke or a wisp of steam from a cooking pot that is visible for a little while and then vanishes into thin air. Now, he's not busting on us saying we're nothing but smoke. What he's saying is that's how quick life seems to be compared to eternity. So we don't know what tomorrow will bring, and James talks about that. So it's an unchangeable fact that we could die today or tomorrow. Like, well, likewise, we live with the reality that Jesus could come back any time. We say that we believe this. We say that, you know what, I'm going to heaven. I believe that Jesus is coming back. I'm going to have a resurrected body, either if I die before he comes back or when he comes back. But if we truly believe that today could be our last, then we may do something or some things or do or say things a slightly bit different, don't you think? If we knew the exact date of our passing, we would probably have an entire different list of priorities. Have you ever thought about that? If you knew that you were to pass on this one specific date, and you might, would you live like hell, if you want to call it that, so you know, live the devil's way, the wicked way, or would you live trying to get as much done for the Lord as possible? See, there's no reason for us to wait until the end to make things right. I hope that you don't put things off until you get some troubling test results before you get things in order. We should live in a way that if we knew for a fact that we would die tomorrow, we wouldn't have to change one single thing. And it's possible. And this is exactly how each and every child of God should live. We should live like tomorrow is our last. And, and do it excitingly. If today was your last day, where would you go? If you could go anywhere you want, where would you go? Where would it be? Would you go to a ball game, a concert, Disney World... Would you take a long vacation? Would you go hunting, fishing? Would you visit another part of America, another country? And there's nothing wrong with all those destinations that you're thinking about as I speak. But nowhere is better than being in the presence of the Heavenly Father. And, and that can be anywhere. That doesn't have to be at home. 
That could be on a mountaintop. That could be in Holland. That could be in Florida, Miami, or Miami's in Florida, I know. Hawaii. It could be anywhere that God leads you. But nothing is better than being in the presence of the Lord. When the psalmist said, A day in the courts is better than a thousand in the tents of wickedness, it's clear where he desired to be. And his desire was honorable. If today was your last day, would you go to a place where you could worship the Lord? Or maybe not. The psalmist speaks of being in the courts of the Lord. The word courts speak of a place that's surrounded by walls. And this reminds us of God's protection. The psalmist says that he would rather spend one day with God than a thousand anywhere else. That should be our desire. We will spend eternity in his presence, and that is a glorious thought. But we don't, and I love this, we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to be with the Lord. There's something special about entering this place and being in the presence of the Almighty. I remember years ago, when I was going through Bible school, uh, Petra came out with the song, and I think Cutlass, Cutlass does it now, or did it a few years ago. It's called uh, Holy of Holies, or Take Me In, and it talks about going into the tabernacle or the tent of meetings actually and walking through each section and i tell you what my pastor he preached on that and he taught on that in school and it mean it meant so much to me and there were every time i hear that song now immediately takes me right into a place of worship and we need to have that no matter where we're at you could be driving down the road and god would take you to that place it's very cute, and, and this is so true to me. It's confusing to me to see people who say they love God and long to be in His presence, but at 12 o'clock rolls around on a Sunday, and they can't wait to get out. Even more confusing are those who say they love Jesus, but they constantly neglect to assemble together with other believers. Now, with COVID, it's hard to, it's hard to assemble. I understand that, but... I, and I don't know a nice way of saying this, and I, I see this posted on Facebook, but when protesters can meet and nobody has a problem with that, but churches meet and, they, and the church people can be fined or put in jail, there's something wrong with that. The Bible specifically tells us to assemble, and our Constitution gives us that right. But people would rather just stay away and do their own thing. And, and I hate to say this, if anything, now COVID is bringing families closer together. I agree with that. And that's fine, but I also think it's splitting the church. I think more and more people are going to get lackadaisical after all this is over with about going to church and say, you know, I did pretty good that last year without going to church. I guess I don't need to assemble. I can still have church in my house and I can still do this. And, and don't get me wrong, there are some people that have to do that. But I tell you what, you will be so much blessed, so much more blessed if you have felt like-minded fellowship with like-minded believers. Uh, <laughs> King David echoed that in Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when I said unto to me, let us go in to the house of the Lord. He was excited about going to the house of the Lord. If today was your last day, would you go to a place to worship the Lord? I said that before. Or would you go to a worldly place? Would you go to a, a place of what they would what the Bible called the tents of wickedness? The psalmist goes on to say that he would rather be a doorkeeper at the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. Notice the contrast. Tents are temporary. And I thought that was really powerful. A place, a house is considered permanent. So it's interesting where with God it's permanency with the, the tents. It wasn't. Anything this world has to offer is like a tent. It's temporary. Did you hear me? It's temporary. And it's one song that they played at the internment. I was trying to get the name of it, but it's a country song. But it talks about how you'll never see a how is it? You never see a a trailer a hearse pulling a trailer. You can't take it with you and all this other. And it was really a neat song. I hope I can find the the words of that sometimes. But anyway. But those things that God offers his children are permanent. Better yet, they are eternal. Too many people are chasing after stuff when you can't take it with you. And then you're going you're gonna to get to heaven. Well, God, I didn't know. And he'll say, you had plenty of chances. Unfortunately, there are multitudes of people who choose the temporary over the eternal. If I suddenly became a millionaire, I would love to visit Ireland. I would like to visit Australia. In fact, there are many places I want to go. 
But I've been around long enough to know that there is no place any better than being in the presence of the Lord. I'd like to hope that if today was my last day, I would be where I am right now. So where would you go if today was your last day? If today was your last day on this earth, where would you spend your time? Would you surrender? If, if today truly could be your last day, and it could, then no choice is more important than choosing to surrender to the Lord. If you know that you have surrendered to Him, then you have an obligation to spend your days serving Him. If today was your last day, and I like this, if today was your day to see your harvest, would you be concerned? The har Now, I'm I don't mean necessarily the eternal harvest, but all the seeds that you planted, and you had a chance to actually see them uh, in a time of harvest, would you be concerned about the worldly things you're leaving behind, or would you be concerned about heaven? Would you be concerned about what those seeds turned out to be like? Or would you know that those seeds were being harvested and were glorifying the Lord? Jesus instructed us concerning the temporal and the eternal. In, yeah, the internal. Matthew 6.19. If you have your Bibles, look it up. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and, moth, <laughs> where ma moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth or rust or, um, can corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So don't waste your time on things that will not matter in eternity. Let us seek to live each day as if it were our last. Did you hear that? Especially considering the fact that it is very well may be your last day. Let us go where the Lord would have us to go. Let us do what the Lord would have us to do. Let us stay as long as, let us stay as long as he would have us to stay. May we seek to go to a worshiping place. May we surrender to the Lord completely. May we serve Him daily. What would you do? Where would you go if today were your last day? And, to, and then your harvest to eternity would be right there. What would you do? Where would you go? Something to really think about. You know, is it all about you? Is it all about you having fun? Or is it all about you glorifying the Lord and blessing the Lord? I know that's a, that's a heavy subject, but you know... I shared with somebody recently, I'm blessed to, to help with the water baptisms. We don't do baby baptisms. We just do a water baptism for new believers. And I'm blessed to uh, be at the hospital when babies are born and when people pass away. I'm there when people get married and I'm there sometimes when they're, when they're buried. And I get to see a lot of regrets. And regrets are a bad thing because sometimes in and I'm serious in my pr profession it's at, when you see the regrets on the people's face it's too late when I look out into that the group of people at a funeral and they regret not telling that person they loved them or they they regret holding a grudge for so long when it was the stupid thing that they did or the stupid thing the other person did and they didn't forgive them is it worth hating somebody destroying your life and, and ruining everything about your life just because of something one, one person did, maybe in one moment's time. I shared this with my congregation before, but I, I learned many, many years ago, um, holding a grudge and, and hating somebody for what they did to you, uh, it, you would be surprised how often those people don't even know or even remember they did it to you. And I'll, I'll make this short, but I, I think it, it's very appropriate. Um, when I was... Uh, when I moved from a small town in eastern Washington to southeastern Washington to a smaller city, I was bullied in sixth grade. I mean, they would beat me up almost every day after school, and and they would tease me at recess, and I and I just I hated sixth grade. I hated it. And there was this one kid, and his name was Lenny Smith. And if you're listening, Lenny, praise the Lord. I doubt if you were, or you are, but it'd be awesome if you did. And Lenny, he, man, he was relentless in messing with me. And he was a pothead. In sixth grade, he was pothead. And so in the junior high, he kept messing with me. But little by little, he kind of backed off. And in high school, I didn't see him much because 
he was too busy smoking and doing his thing. Well, lo and behold, and you're going to laugh about this, but lo and behold, I got out of the out of high school and I joined the Navy. And in boot camp, who comes through about a week and a half, two weeks um, while I'm there at boot camp? Here he comes with his long shoulder length hair. And he actually saw me. He didn't recognize me at first because I was had an afro before. And uh, they shaved his head. He looked so funny. All of a sudden, he didn't look so um, intimidating. Well, then I didn't see him for four years. I got out of the Navy. I became a shipping foreman in a warehouse, an onion warehouse. And uh, who ends up getting a job there? Lenny Smith. And I mean, I used to, I just stayed away from him, and, but pretty soon I had to be his boss. And, and, you know, he seemed like an okay guy. I'm thinking, you know, he's 20-some years old now, and he seems okay. And one day I'm sitting across from him in the lunchroom, and I finally said, you know, Lenny, i got to tell you something, man. I said, you know, I really, I really don't appreciate what you did to me in sixth grade. He said, what did I do to you in sixth grade? And I told him, he goes, he goes man, he goes, I'm really sorry that I did that. I, I was doing drugs back then, and I don't remember anything. So I said, oh, man, you, I forgive you. No big deal. And I, and I went home thinking about that. I go, man, are you kidding me? I've hated this guy since sixth grade. And, it, and he, I thought for sure that my hatred was just making his life miserable. He didn't even, it didn't make a difference in his life one bit. It just, all he, he didn't even remember doing it. And I let that churn and rot in my body for so long. So that just told me, you know what? If you got a problem with the situation, take care of it. You know, repent and go on. And if the person doesn't want to receive it, that's between them and God. But then also, don't keep bringing it up. I forgave him, and I, I hope to see him again. I hope he gets saved and comes to be with the Lord. That would be awesome. But, you know, don't hold all these negative feelings and stuff. Get it taken care of because we have stuff to do for the Lord. We all do. So I just want to challenge you. If you were to die today or tomorrow, would you be satisfied with the with the crop, with the harvest? that you basically brought in, I know you'll be satisfied with eternal life, but will you be satisfied with what you've done for the Lord? Let, let's just pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you that you are a God, a loving God, a caring God, a merciful God. Father, if there's anybody out there that's holding any kind of grudge or animosity towards a family member, a, a husband, wife, spouse, old friend, whatever, any somebody that hurt them when they were younger, Lord, let today be the day they say, you know, Father, help me forgive that person. And there are some people, they've done such terrible things to us, Lord, that we can't do it on our own, but with your help, we can do all things. And Lord, if that person is still alive and I have access to them, allow me to ask for forgiveness directly to them and then, then go on with life. If the person receives it, fine. If they don't, that's between them and you. Lord, I ask that you just bless everybody that heard this message today. Allow them to really think, think about eternity. But don't sit there and pout and worry about it, but instead get joyful, get excited, and continue to plant powerful, wonderful seeds for the glory of the Lord. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, have a great week in the Lord. Y'all take care now, and um, Dr. Pegg will see you tomorrow at 7. Take care.